Well, so let's continue on with the uh, uh, next chapter in this course. So this is essentially, this is an application of a probability uh, or we extend the concept of random variables by bringing in time. So that's where the processes come in. Things are evolving in time, except generally when some, sometimes things evolve, you get uh, a, a one, uh, one realization or you have one waveform against the time. That's our general concept of something happening. But in the phenomena that we are dealing with, it's not one realization for the same one, depending on the all sorts of parameters, etc. There could be a variety of uh, waveforms. So, in other words, you know, qualitatively, when I say noise, it's not just one waveform. Depending on where you start, when you look at it, uh, etc., uh, the same phenomena. Um, uh, yeah, but if you measure it, you will get a different waveform. So. So you could say that the stochastic process is, is a collection of waveforms. So the question is why collection, etc. So obviously something is random here. So you can see the randomness or uh, the in the random in the variable in the case of the random variables, the randomness was giving you a particular value, whereas here it looks like uh, it's giving you a whole series of waveforms. So if there is a underlying phenomena which causes the randomness, we could say that that random variable is causing the, uh, uh, causing the uh, something so that you get a different waveform. So in other words, what I'm trying to say is depending on the, say you have a state of a set of all outcomes, depending on the outcome, whatever is the experimental outcome, in other words, uh, for that experiment, it may be a big experiment like uh, the weather, Lot of uh, whatever is the random phenomena, uh, ultimately what is, uh, it will be a, set, a specific value of C and that corresponds to whatever wind or rain or etc. So a stochastic process is a collection of very uh, uh, waveforms. So already a waveform means there's already one function, which is function of time, but being collection, we can see there is another variable in the, you can represent the way I have represented along y-axis. And that variable is the cause of randomness. So one variable is due to the randomness, other one is just a time. So what I'm trying to say, if this is the thing, if you fix uh, the randomness, then it is just one waveform. For any fixed value, you get uh, one waveform. That will be like any other waveform, like today's weather. That's, uh, but tomorrow's weather, will be depending on whatever is the, thank you, uh, whatever is the parameter corresponding to tomorrow. Another way to look at it is if you freeze time, let's say fix a time to T naught, then you see suddenly you're looking along, uh, along that uh, the T naught axis, you see that different, different values for different values of psi. So in other words, that's nothing but the random variable. So another way to say is that if you fix a time, you get a random variable. And you fix a time to be, uh, this is T1, let's say, so you get a random variable X1. And you fix time to be T2, you get, uh, you get some values. So that corresponds to uh, the different realizations corresponding to the size. So this is another X2, which is X or T2. So that's, uh, that's another way to look at the stochastic process. So the best way to look at uh, stochastic processes is as if uh, that it's a collection of waveforms. Uh, time is well defined. So the collection comes up because depending on the natural process, the randomness is going to be specified by the C and that generates a, a waveform. For example, uh, let's say, uh, let's take a simple stochastic process. You toss a coin, that's the randomness. So you have two outcomes. When you get head, you get one waveform. When you get tail, you get a different waveform. That's all. So that's the uh, 
So the question is, how do you characterize this? Remember, this is a mess because we have now brought in time into the thing. So we already have a clue. The, so the thing to realize is for any fixed time, the stochastic process behaves like a random variable. So you can see one easy way to characterize this. Uh, of course, time is uncountably infinite. There are a lot of time values, but I can take a bunch of uh, time instances, right? So call these time instances t1, t2, etc., tn. So I'll draw it in the next page. So generally, this is x of t comma psi or, <coughs> and I, I look at time instance t1, t2, let's say tn. So I have random variables x1, x2, xn. So xi is x of uh, ti comma psi. So for each time instant, it's a, it's a random variable. And we just studied about random variables. So if you have n random variables, they must have a joint density function. So that's one way to characterize the, uh, the stochastic process. In other words, take arbitrary n time instants so for time instance t1, t2, et cetera, tn, this generates the random variables x t1, x2, et cetera, xi is x of ti comma psi, et cetera, xn. And we can think of their joint density function x1, x2, xn. So that is x1, x2, et cetera, xn. But the, just to remind us, remember this x1 has no, x1 of course corresponds to time t1. If I change t1 to somewhere else, I'll get a different random variable. So I'll also uh, say, uh, put it specifically that this joint density function is a function of t1, t2, etc., tn. So here is time. So this is the uh, nth order characterization of a process. So remember, we did bring in time. So what we see is as the different time instants are creating different random variables. So they, you know, we already studied, they may be correlated, they may be dependent, they may be independent, etc. So we will see. Of course, if it is the same process, you expect some correlation between them. How do you express that? Uh, how do you study that? So you can see where I'm going. That's where we are going, actually. So if this is nth, let me do the simplest characterization. Simplest characterization will be for any one random variable. In other words, in this, if I take at a time instant t, I get the random variable x1 with t1. If this is x of uh, t1. So f of x of x1 at uh, t1 or is the first order characterization. So similarly, if I put n equal to two, this was n equal to one. So if I put n equal to two, I get two random variables. I have time instance t1 and t2. That gives me x1 at t1 comma psi and x2 at uh, uh, t2 comma psi, two random variables. So I can think of their joint density function or joint distribution function. So this is the second order characterization. So you can do the third order characterization, fourth order, nth order, all the way. Where do we stop? We really stop nowhere because you can take any infinite uh, sequences of time, right? And the, uh, and in fact, uh, if the T is, if it is a continuous, so we call the stochastic process to be continuous time if it is de well defined for all values of t. If it is only, if, if the stochastic process happens to be defined only for discrete values, then we call it a discrete time stochastic process. One way to generate a discrete time stochastic process is sample a continuous time stochastic process. Of course, you lose information, but sometimes a certain phenomena 
you can only observe it discrete uh, at a discrete time instance like uh, the maybe uh, the moon going around and uh, if you are observing a certain phase of moon with all the background it only comes in once in 14 days etc right lot of astronomical phenomena the sun spots they have some cycles and so on right uh, so what so maybe certain things you are you can only observe it uh, yeah you can only observe it uh, at a certain time instance that it's so in other words if the stochastic process is only defined for t1 comma t2 so there will be some observations here and here so this is a discrete time process if this time happens to be uh, multiples of t then it is uniformly discrete except right t1 and t2 are not random variables you are just arbitrary time instance on the x axis the only randomness is due to the underlying physical phenomenon which is so randomness is due to this psi uh, so as i said take weather there is no river uh, or temperature uh, temp you can in the city you can plot the temperature as a function of time right why is the temperature uh, so the temperature varies for whatever uh, reason so, so today's temperature you certainly can uh, plot it as a function of time but then you come back and do it tomorrow you are not going to get the same function because whatever is the underlying randomness uh, the weather conditions have changed and you will get a different graph so that's a perfect example of a stochastic process location is the same we just put a monitor here in brooklyn and record a uh, so that will be one line like this today and tomorrow it may be a slightly different line another day it will be a different line another day so it's all the uh, weather phenomenon corresponding to this location due to whatever so the, uh, this is a stochastic process why is it different waveforms because it's a complex thing and all that complexity we uh, put it uh, we we uh, capture here psi now you can make this a vector this and that but let's start with the simply you so we all the randomness is captured in this psi and that so if you freeze time then you are seeing this different value so that looks like a random variable the question is does this random variable and the random variable after one hour do they have any relation that's what we are going to study so the first order characterization is through the uh, you fix a time at any point, you get the one density function. Second order is you have the second order density. So usually in this course, we are people only use these two because you can of course go to third order, fourth order, etc. But uh, so this course will just study using this first and second order characterization. So if you have density functions f of x comma t corresponding to the random variable x of t. And then remember, you can uh, another way. This is a density function, so it's it has got all the properties we have studied. This is a density function. Anyone? How do you? Uh, in addition, in place of the density function, we can use two parameters to describe the same random variable. What are they? Anybody? Yeah, mean and variance comes to our mind. So, another way to characterize the first order characterization. So remember again, we have a process. So we take some time instant t. You have a random variable x, but if you have a random variable x, as he said, you can think of the mean of the process. So we take a typical time t, create the random variable that has a density function. So expected value of x of t corresponding to that random, you can put a t naught or t1 if you want. So that's going to be multiplied by x multiplied by the density function. Notice that the density function is a function of time. So generally this will turn out to be a function of time. We write it like this because of the time. And sometimes this may turn out to be a constant, but generally mean is a function of time. So
so that's one uh, one way to uh, that's another characterization for the stochastic process what is the mean value remember if you have a temperature nobody is asking you oh give me the temperature plot for the whole day but that's not what we are doing if you look at the weatherman the weatherman will say today's average temperature is whatever uh, 55 degrees something so the weatherman is essentially doing somehow this operation the mean and giving you a number and you know definitely the mean is a function of time because the weather in the, the temperature in the morning is not the same as strictly speaking the temperature in the evening etc but uh, somehow you know uh, just to get to give you an idea he gives you a ballpark number he or she so that's from the first order density function so similarly remember so this is the first order characterization similarly if you have a, uh, if you take uh, characterization if you have uh, two time instants t1 and t2 yeah yeah so the you know, i am sorry that i that was a mistake integration is not on t i mean so this is it should be on x so i guess the, this is what somebody one of your friends were telling i make mistakes but these are sort of mistakes uh, you can see the context it was a silly mistake thank you very much so if the integration is remember of course it is on x in other words you know how to do you have a random variable random variable is x so expected value of x fx x dx it just so happens that the density function happens to be a function of time right so similarly if you take two time instants you get two random variables x1 and x2 x2 is x of t2 comma psi etc so of course you have if you have two random variables you have uh, the their joint density function it's a function also it's a function the random variable this is just to remind you that if i had taken the time instant t1 somewhere else i'll get a new random variable with a different density function so of course it's important you cannot write this density function without t1 and t2 that would mean they are the same for all t1 and t2 that may not be true so that's the, usually the joint density function description and we have studied about a joint density function now my question is if i have a joint a joint density function how do you represent the same thing using one parameter anybody how do you represent the two param two random variables using one parameter that we have studied so that would be the correlation right if you obviously if you have two random variables you can say how are they correlated so that is expected remember correlation was expected value of uh, x of t1 and x of t2 star minus mu1 mu2 but at, this is the key key concept right so this is your just like say expected value of x y or x1 x2 star so this is nothing but double integral x1 x2 fx1 x2 x1 comma x2 but these density functions happens to be functions of t1 and t2 and i'm not going to make the mistake again it is dx1 dx2 okay so notice this is a fun this could be a function of t1 comma t2 that's all i want to say so of course you can do the joint density function description or you can use this parameter so let me write it one more time because it's an important parameter so expected value of x of t1 multiplied by x of t2 what do we call this uh, in uh, ra- in the random variables anybody so this is a correlation right definitely so we call this the auto correlation function and we this will stay with us throughout the course this is a this is the way the process is usually described so as i said this is going to be double integral x1 x2 fx so you can see one issue is you need the joint density function to compute this so notice that uh, even here 
the way i have written i should have put a star here in the previous page i should have put a star here of course if everything is real uh, there is no reason uh, dx1 dx2 and you may say uh, oh previously i have uh, dealing with covariance of x1 comma x2 of course covariance is remember x1 x2 uh, star minus uh, what is covariance expected value of x1 minus its mean multiplied by x2 minus its mean star so this if you expand you will get uh, this function so uh, the means we know so whether we subtract this or not you can see the the, uh, the relation between covariance and correlation so the impo so if you want you can, uh, so once the, let me you, give you the symbol that's used for this autocorrelation function is usually written like this as i said this will once you integrate this will turn out to be a function of t1 and t2 so we'll show that it's a, it could be a function of t1 comma t2 and we put here xx to denote that we are dealing with the same function so of course the covariance of the function you can write it like this if you want so once you know the autocorrelation you know the covariance so usually we traditionally we deal with the autocorrelation function so one and the same thing so this is another way to describe the uh, another way to describe the uh, stochastic process any questions yeah Uh, so uh, we have i have talked about first and second order density functions so we can call them strict characterization because there is no more uh, the best way to the uh, the complete information about the random variable is given by its density function two random variables through their joint density functions and once you have the density function you can also talk about the mean of the process so that's expected value of x of t which we talked about or so you can see this is a derived quantity uh, so this is the mean of the process so mean is integral x fx of x comma t dx as i said the integration is not with respect to time time is just fixing the random variable and similarly if you have the joint density function you can talk about the autocorrelation function so that's rxx t1 comma t2 so that's uh, expected value of xt1 xt2 so remember you look at this page there are four characterizations the one on the left usually all called strict characterization of the process so you can see the right side is a loose representation right uh, obviously these are derived quantities these are the fundamental quantities uh, corresponding to random variables x or x1 and x2 these are the fundamental quantities from here you can de 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 define these properties so we are going to spend a lot a lot of time using only studying these uh, pro these things for all sorts of processes and looking at all the uh, what else how far we can push these things especially the autocorrelation function 
so before i do some examples so, uh, so in this lecture all i am going to do is show you different ex uh, auto, uh, we will discuss different uh, stochastic processes and we will compute their mean and auto correlation function so you will say what is the big deal you will see what is the big deal even for reasonably complicated problems it's uh, it gets involved then i uh, will ask you to do few problems but before i do that understand the big picture we have strict characterization using the density functions or we have not so strict or loose characterization using the mean and auto correlation so generally which one do you think will be easier for us to do as a practical matter the left side or the right side which one because uh, which is more difficult to do let me ask you this way which is more difficult to find out remember generally you get some data on the left side look at it you need the joint density functions no one gives us this joint density functions but if you look at the right side it's just a mean okay you say i have an idea how to compute the mean etc so you can clearly see that maybe the description on the right side is easier and uh, more uh, than compared to the left side but left side also we need to keep in mind and to understand the properties so we have two things going on at the same time strict characterization loose characterization i didn't write anything on the title so you can call it uh, not so strict or uh, uh, loose characterization strict is using the density functions so you have the second order density function third order fourth order nth order all the way to infinity there is no end usually we won't even know the first order density function so look at the weatherman they don't talk about the density function they just talk about the mean value but even the mean value we can see you you can say to compute it i need the density function so we will discuss in couple of classes how to compute this without the density function for which processes can i approximate it this some other way etc so it will all depend on the properties of the density function these are the because basically that's what is going on for you so a stochastic process is not defined by one density function or two density functions or three it's a collection of all these density functions so you can see the big picture so all these density functions for all values of n uh, represents the strict characterization of the stochastic process but you may say look that is too much give me something simpler if that is the case we will go with uh, these two characterizations the mean and auto correlation function so then we will see how much more we can extract from these things so again before i do some examples let me introduce one more concept so this is a stochastic process the way i have written two variables t and c t is along this axis time a uh, collection of wave forms and let me take a, to characterize it let me take some time instance to, uh, all of them doesn't have to be equal i'm just taking them uh, at t1 t2 ti tn you can see i've done, not done it uniformly i'm going to call these random variables x1 x2 etc xn so you have the you of course you have n random variables at time instance t1 t2 etc tn and i have the i have their joint density function so that's the characterization of these random variables now to see whether remember the concept of stationarity means is there anything that is not changing with respect to time that's the idea or is the stochastic process so crazy that 
nothing is uh, you cannot detect anything so is there anything stationary under underlying this process to to find out what i am going to do watch what i am going to do i am going to do i am going to shift all this time instance by some constant amount of c so I, this will be t1 plus c and the next one also gets a shifted by c so this is t2 plus c etc etc and the last one let's say let me draw it here tn plus c that's the time instance so i get new new random variables i'm going to call it x1 prime x2 prime etc x n prime and so they also have a joint density function x1 prime x2 prime etc x n prime and i'm going to put the variables here as x because i want to compare these two x1 x2 etc x n corresponding to time instance t1 plus c etc tn plus c so remember i have two density functions one in blue forget about this negative sign one in blue one in green the one on the left is corresponding to time instance t1 through tn and the one on the right is i have shifted everything to tomorrow so look at this today uh, today 9 am 10 am 11 am three uh, three time instances i look at their joint behavior which is given by this density function i come back after one month or one day and look at the same behavior tomorrow and that's described by this so if these two things are equal what what do you what can you say about the process suppose these two are equal either they are equal or they are not equal let's say they are equal then what do you say what do you see here a shift in time has what a shift in time what did it do to the density function yeah, it shows some sort of time invariance right so the our stationarity so two things can happen so let me uh, say that we will call the process to be strictly stationary or in other words time invariant if this is true so what is the condition once again you you pick up bunch of time instances t1 to 3n how many tn it doesn't matter you pick up any any you want then you shift it by a constant amount all of them look at the two sets of density functions if they are equal for all values of t1 through tn then we call the process to be strict sense stationary so this is called strict sense stationary you can you can see i cannot think of anything more than stricter than this right strict sense stationary the if this is true for all n so what is the simplest n we can check on this one n equal to this is i put some arbitrary n what is the smallest n i can check what n what is the smallest value of n one of course why so one means what i take one random variable whatever its behavior i look at the same random variable tomorrow if it then two density functions are the same that's uh, that's some stationarity so let me go, so that we will call that first order strict sense stationary so i am introducing the concept of yeah say it again any what c yes any c well so let me write it here so i'm going to write the definition here strict sense stationary processes so we will call this uh, yes 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 okay strict sense stationary always uh, x of t is strict sense stationary if so you he, he is right any c hello this was your question any c c can be any value
So this is the definition of strict sense rationality. So of course, xi's are here, x at the ti's, and xi primes are x of uh, ti plus c. Okay. So you have, so basically you have these different realizations. I take time instance T1, T2, Tn, and then I shift all of them by some amount C, same amount C. So I get uh, T1 plus C, et cetera, Tn plus C. I get random variables x1, x2, et cetera, xn. And I get new random variables x1 prime, et cetera, xn prime. We want the joint density function of these. I'm going to call this as a vector x. x1, et cetera, xn. Corresponding to time instance t1 to tn, we want this to be equal to the joint density function of this. Let me call this to be a vector x prime. So that's going to be x prime. Remember, there is no point in using uh, different variables here. And if you want to compare, you should use the same variables. But it is very clear. The address is different random variables. So this is t1 plus c, etc. tn plus c. So this is the a definition for nth order strict sense stationary xn is so Xn is n -th order strict sensationary if this is true. So the question is, what should be the value of n? So we can do for different values of n. We cannot go anywhere below zero. So if n is one, what that means is if I have a stochastic process at some time instance t, and if it shift by c, I get a new time instant. I get one random variable x1 here, another one, uh, I'm going to call it uh, x2 here, so or x1 prime rather. So I need fx of x of t must be the same as fx1 prime of x of t1 plus c. This is the first order strict sense stationary characterization. So X of T is said to be first order strict sense stationary if this is true for all C, as he said, for all C. So let me put C, if it is true for all C, let me put C equal to, so we must have FX of x comma t equal to fx prime of x comma t plus c for all c. So put c equal to minus t. So this is the first order strict sense stationary characterization. So that gives you fx of x comma t is fx of x. Because you can put a t, a c equal to minus t for any c, right? So what is the conclusion here? If a process is strict sensationally, what happens to its first order density function? Anybody? It's a first order density function is? What do you see on the right side? It doesn't depend on time, exactly, right. So it makes sense, look at here. I mean, it doesn't make complete sense. What it says is, if the, pro look at here what I'm saying, if the properties, if the density function is invariant here and here, naturally it cannot depend on C. You see, it makes sense, right? So if, this, if the density functions are the same and for all values of C, then it cannot be a function of C. So that's the, if a process is first order strict stationary, then it is not a function of time. That means uh, for such processes, What is the value of the mean if that is case? Look at here. Mean is expected value of x of t. That's integral x fx x dx. This will turn out to be what? Anybody? 
because the density function is not a function of time. So this will turn out to be what? What? Just a constant, not a function of time. You can call it mu x, right? But not mu x of t. Remember, this is just a property, property of the first order sticks and stationary. So if the process is first order strict and stationary, uh, then one property, one consequence is the mean is a constant. So let's study the second order strict and stationary. Then the rest of the class I'll spend on examples. So of course you can see what it says is that their joint density functions are the same. That's what it means. In other words, f x one comma x two, x one comma x two at t one comma t two is the same as f x one prime x two prime x one comma x two t one plus c t two plus c. This should be true for all c. for all C. So here, let me put C equal to minus T1. So essentially you get, this should be true, Fx1 comma X2, uh, X1 comma X2, uh, C equal to minus T1. So this will become simply T2 minus T1. Or I could have put a T C equal to minus T2. So this will become T2 minus T1. So you can see this joint density function only depends on T2 minus T1. Uh, oh, t or t1 minus t2 depending on uh, uh, either way t1 minus t2 or its absolute value right so if a process if a process is second order strict and stationary then you get the joint density function depends only on t1 minus t2 or t2 minus t1 so what about the autocorrelation function as a consequence so look at here so the joint density function here, this is second order characterization, second order strict and stationary. Uh, this one depends on uh, T2 minus T1. I'm usually I, we will use a variable tau here if you want. So let's compute the autocorrelation function Rxx T1 comma T2. That's by definition expected value of X1, X2 star this is double integral x1, x2 star, this density function. Remember, it's a strict, uh, second order strict and stationary. So this is fx1, x2, x1 comma x2, tau. Tau is t1 minus t2, dx1, dt2. So this will turn out to be a function of t1 minus t2, not t1 comma t2, like here. Or you can write it as rxx of tau. This is a second property. <laughs> so on the left side, what you see is first and second order strict and stationary characterizations give you the first order density function is not a function of time. The second order density, joint density function depends on T1 minus T2. On the right side, you have loose descriptions about the same process. 
the first property is the mean is a constant and the second property is autocorrelation function depends only on t1 minus t2 remember these are properties of from here so which one is stronger this side or left side or right side which one is more fundamental this side or this side more fundamental huh which one left side is more fundamental these are properties but these are easy to comprehend rather than this so we are, i am going to i am going to create a new remember these properties are not the oh, look at the old uh, look at the original definition the mean could be a function of time which is not the case here autocorrelation depends on t1 comma t2 which is not the case here so this has got more structure so i am going to use these two properties to define a new stationary new concept of stationarity i will call it uh, people usually call it wide sense stationary so why the sense stationary or wss so do you see do you need any proof do you clearly see that if a process is strict sense stationary it is already wide sense stationary why is that because strict sense stationarity is used to derive wide sense stationarity so in the next page i am going to write this theorem a strict sense stationary process is always wide sense stationary <clears throat> first of all what is wide sense stationary these two properties all right so All right, so uh, strict sense stationarity gives you wide sense stationarity, but let me answer this question. So look at here, the joint density function at t1 comma t2 is the same as at t1 plus c, t2 plus c. But this is true for all c. So put c equal to what did I say? C equal to minus t1. Then this becomes zero. This becomes t2 minus t1. So I can write this as a function of t1 minus t2, or as I mean t two minus t one, or put c equal to minus t two, then I can write it as t one minus t two. Ask them whether that is clear. Yeah. So the joint density function of a strict order stationary process only let me write it like this. It only depends on tau, some function of x one, x two, and tau. Not four variables, three variables. So when you do the autocorrelation function. uh it there is only one variable tau so the rxx becomes a function of t1 minus t2 or t2 minus t1 <coughs> hmm? all right let's let us concentrate on this uh, concept so here i have shown that the two properties of strict sense stationarity can be used, used to show that the mean is constant and autocorrelation depends on only on t1 minus t2 so i am going to use these two properties to derive a new stationarity so remember strict order stationarity is very clear yes right it is most likely one way relation <laughs> so let me define wide sense stationarity so x of t is so this is called wss x of t is wide sense stationary two conditions if 
expected value of x of t is what anybody what did i say except for value except is constant right and what is the second property r x x t1 comma depends only on autocorrelation only depends on t1 minus t2 so these are the two uh, uh, properties so let me give you a theorem strict sense stationarity of course implies wide sense stationarity but this way is not a true the other way may may not be true unless there is an exception unless x of t is gaussian yeah x of what is it read it again No, x of t is strict sense stationary means implies the if you take one random variable x one, this density function is this. We we proved this. Right? It's not a function of t. This is only a function of x. If you take two random variables, we said that the, the joint density function only depends on t one minus t two. and in general if you take three random variables x1 x or n random variables x1 etc xn and t1 plus t1 comma etc t2 tn depends on x1 etc xn t1 plus c etc tn plus c nothing it doesn't have to be uniform these density functions could be poisson or gaussian etc where is uniform here there is nothing uniform here the dense so don't confuse strict sense stationarity only has something to do with what is the joint behavior here and if i push everything tomorrow if i come back and look at the same process tomorrow is the joint behave is the joint density function exactly the same as what happened today whatever that density we have no idea what the density function is any other questions any questions so ask the uniform uh, the whether that uniform confusion is over or not so remember strict sense stationarity has nothing to do with density function you we we don't even know what the joint density functions are and so certainly you can have any density function nothing uniform here so so the theorem is this way you know how the proof goes right strict sense stationarity of course you can see because we i just showed you once a process is strict sense stationary first order density function is independent of x that gives you the first property second order density function only depends on t1 minus t2 that gives you this property and that, those are the basic definitions for wide sense stationarity so strict sense stationarity gives you wide sense stationarity and you can see wide sense stationary which is just the two properties is going to tell you nothing about the density function in general that's true unless it is a gaussian process so let me start this uh, this point to show what is a gaussian process so that's a good uh, place to so you'll see what we learned is how so is the noise process gaussian when we called so this is the way you uh, you take arbitrary time instance t1 t2 etc tn and look at their joint density function and uh, this joint density function must be jointly gaussian i don't know whether you remember the jointly gaussian so jointly gaussian will look like this i'll i'll explain to you what these things are
So if you take any number of uh, random variables, x1, x, this x is x1, x2, etc., cetera, xn, their joint, uh, uh, their joint density function must have the joint Gaussian expression. So what does this expression mean? So let's look at uh, one random variable. So of course, if x is, uh, x, x is Gaussian, then the fx of x comma t will look like what we learned, one, one over square root of two pi sigma squared e raised to minus. And the sigma squared t is expected value of x squared minus mu x squared t, right? So this is sigma squared t. That's the one order density function. So if you look at it here, I wrote, I don't know whether we discussed this, but I can easily derive this. A joint density function of n Gaussian random variables will look like this. What is R here? So if I define R to be a matrix with uh, uh, R, Rij as uh, expected value of Xti minus mu Ti, multiplied by xtj minus mu tj star. In other words, this is expected value of xti xtj star minus mu xti mu j uh, mu x tj. Remember, so that's the, that's the covariance matrix so the density function of x is uh, this t is t1, t2, etc. 1 over r. So actually, there is a square root here. There is a square root here. Um, square root of the determinant. e raised to minus x transpose r inverse x by 2. So, uh, so this is the joint density function of uh, X. So let me just uh, rewrite in the next page. So you have time instance T1, Tn, the joint density function is one over r e to the power minus half x transpose r inverse x by two. So what is this x? x is of course x1, x try xn. So that's a scalar. r has got, rij is the entry. rij is what? Uh, expected value of xti, xtj minus mu ti, mu tj. Remember, I'm going to assume that the pro x of t is wide sun stationary, and then I'm going to assume, then let me shift everything by c, all these y values. So t1 plus c, I shift uh, uh, this to tn plus c, etc. So I'm going to call this y. y is x1 prime, x2 prime, etc., xn prime. So first, let me uh, uh, let me look at this uh, density function here, and I, then I look at the density function of uh, this y, y evaluated at x. So that's corresponding to the new co autocorrelation function. But uh, for Whitson stationarity, what do we have? Mean is a constant, and autocorrelation only depends on t1 minus t2, right? So you notice this. This will be if the process is Whitson stationary. Then we have, this is constant. This will be just mu x squared, constant. And this quantity will be only depending on R of Ti, ti minus Tj. Instead of ti, Tj. So look at here. This is what is going to sit here. You have Ti minus Tj. Here you will have Ti plus C minus Tj plus C. So corresponding to this also, you will get the exactly, because this will be for the Y, it will be R of Ti plus C minus tj plus c. When you do this, you get, uh, this is for the y, y vector. 
I'm just doing the proof for you. So this is also T A minus T J. My point is whether you look at the covariance matrix corresponding to these or these, they will exactly be the same. You do you see it? Because the covariance matrix only depends on T A minus T J. So if you shift everything by a constant amount, the T A minus T J will be the same. Means will be constant. So the covariance covariance uh, the co the density function. among this n random variables and this n random variables will be exactly the same giving you strict sense stationarity so for gaussian you can see how you get it, it depends on this uh, structure of the covariance matrix uh, this is you should read the proof in uh, listen a little more detail in my book and uh, notes so the lecture the slides so Oh, one more time if you look at these density functions this will have some rx if you shift everything by c c these density functions will be t1 plus c t2 uh, tn plus c let me call their covariance matrix y this is t1 through tn remember it's a gaussian process so here the density function is some constant 1 over rx e to the power minus x transpose r x inverse r here the density function is 1 over r y uh, to the half e raised to minus i'm going to use the same variable x transpose r y x by 2 the x transpose r y x is a scalar you can see if i if i, I already showed you that r x is r y the two covariance matrices are the same so the two density functions are the same but this density function corresponds to t1 t2 tn uh, this density function corresponds to t1 plus c t etc tn plus c so the two density functions at this time instant and the other time instants are the same consequently in this case white sense stationarity leads to strict sense stationarity for gaussian processes only this is the only exception so for gaussian processes if we say stationary that means uh, both it's white sense stationary but it's also strict sense stationary so we discuss the uh, we discuss the characterization of the stochastic process through its density functions uh and also through mean and autocorrelation function and then we discuss the strict sense stationary processes and white sense stationary processes so autocorrelation function is a key prop uh, key relation mean only can tell you so much so let me look at the autocorrelation function a little more so when i write it like this it is not stationary or if it was white sense i am just writing in general so this is autocorrelation function uh, first property is this is also true so some of this you should be able to prove it so this is the first property of the autocorrelation if i flip the variables you just count plus conjugation that cc because go to the definition uh, so r of t1 comma t2 which is expected value of x t1 x t2 star i can pull out the star remember expectation is just expectation is what x1 x2 a density function here right so if i pull out the star outside this becomes x2 x1 star the same density function so i just flipped it so this becomes expected value of x t2 x t1 star and that's this so you get that so you get that one all right so the next property is so if it is stationary what happens so if if r, if x of t is white sense stationary you remember we have r x x t1 comma t2 is this is always true so if it is white sense stationary then this becomes 
if i call t1 minus t2 this becomes uh, t1 minus t2 first variable minus second variable here you have uh, t2 minus t1 so if i call t1 minus t2 to be tau we get rx tau is rxx so this is another uh, property or rxx minus tau is So if the x of t is white sun stationary, then all this is true. The next property is the most important property. Star is complex conjugate. What do you mean? May you don't know what star is? No, complex conjugate. So A is a matrix. We call the matrix to be non-negative definite if you multiply by some vector like this, same vector. So A transpose. So now we have reached a time you need to learn some matrix algebra. To do some of these problems, it's. Uh, positive definite matrices non negative definite matrices eigen values eigen vectors all this uh, you should know by now i mean you should do a favor and learn some of it not only for this class but uh, and uh, if you go through my lectures there is actually a video on just the elementary matrix properties So if you multiply uh, by a matrix with the same vector of left and right, then you get a scalar. You can see this is n by n, this is one by n, this is n by one. So you get one by one scalar. So for any matrix, if you multiply by a, any vector a, and if you get a positive number, that's a property of the matrix. For if this is true for any a, then we call this a to be a Uh, non-negative definite matrix. And we call it positive definite if this is strictly positive. So let me show you an example of a positive definite matrix. Uh, so A is positive definite. So take this matrix. Let's see. Uh, I'm going to multiply by a transpose a. So a tra a is uh, or uh, some x transpose x. So I'll call it here x y e c. So this is just x and y x y. So first row into first column. What do I get? A two x minus y, comma. Here you get uh, minus x plus y, right? Multiplied by x y. So this will be uh, here. You get two x minus y multiplied by x plus minus x plus y multiplied by y. 
So if you expand, you can see this will give you 2x squared minus xy minus xy minus 2xy plus y squared. So I can write this as x minus y the whole squared plus x squared. So you can see it doesn't matter whether I take x and y for any values of x and y, this will always be positive unless x is zero, y is zero. So this is a property of the matrix A, not X and Y, because any X and any X, any Y, this is uh, true. So what I have shown is this property is true for here. It is a positive number. So we this, this must be a positive matrix, positive definite. Not PDF, positive definite. I'm going to show that your autocorrelation matrix, if you autocorrelations, if you put it into a matrix form that has got this property. At least it will be always non-negative definite. So what am I trying to say? Let me put, uh, let me take the autocorrelations of x1, x2, etc, xn. xi is x of ti. So I arrange the random variables into a vector. I am going to do the expected value of xx transpose. That means expected value of this vector, x1, x2, etc., xn, multiplied by its transpose, x1, etc., xn transpose. So when I do the expected value, it will be expected value of here, xi, xj transpose. Here, this will be expected value of x1 squared. So you can see this is R11 or R. So let me call a notation R i j is R of T a comma T j. Just easy make it. So this is R one one R one two R i j, R n n, R n one, R one n etc. So that's the autocorrelation matrix. So I'm going to show that this autocorrelation matrix is positive definite. Remember, this is a property of the any stochastic process. That's the whole point. Why is this important? This is very important because it will come up uh, in power spectrum, this and that and all that. So I'm going to take uh, any vector R and multiply by A transpose AJ. This is the same as if you do the multiplication, this is the same as AI, AJ star, RTI, TJ star. So this is another way to write. So again, you should brush up your, uh, so I have a matrix. This is your RIJ. I multiply by a, a vector on the left and right to make it a scalar. I'm going to show that this number is always positive. So if I take this age, ages are arbitrary. That's the whole point. Another way to look at it is like this. If I take this quadratic product, double summation AI, AJ star, RTI, TJ, this will always be non-negative. I'm going to show I equal to. So you can ask why is that? So that's the property of the autocorrelation function for any process RXX. So to prove this, let me define y to be summation ai x of ti. Anybody, what is y? Anybody? x of ti's are a bunch of random variables, xt1, xt2, xtn. So if I add a bunch of random variables and scale them, what do you get? y will be another? X plus Y, if you add two random variables, what do you get? You forgot? You are not going to get a constant. What do you get? A new random variable. So here, if you scale a bunch of random variables and add them, you get a new random variable. It will have its density function, right? We don't know what it is, but it will have some density function. So let's compute the expected value of Y squared. So that's what, by definition, y squared, f y, y dy. This quantity, at least, what can you say about expected value of y squared? What can you say? Minimum. It will be? Look at it. It's, it's a 
positive multiplied by positive integrated so it will be what at least positive at least a positive right very good so now i am going to rewrite this in terms of this xtis and see what happens remember the proofs so ideas are simple so expected value of y squared is the same as expected value of summation ai x of ti absolute value squared now you know how to expand an absolute value right so that's going to be summation ai x of ti summation and one more time this is on i this is aj x of tj but this has got a star and then there is an expected value outside expectation is linear so if i pull out the summations outside and the constants outside the expectation is only on x of ti and x of tj but this is r of ti comma tj so what looked impossible we just proved it we proved that this quantity is this this is positive so this quantity must be positive so that's a property of the autocorrelation function if you want this whole thing you can write it like this so you need to go home and expand and show that this is exactly the same as this so this quantity is if it is strictly positive we call the autocorrelation function to be positive definite if it is uh, for like this some values it could be zero then we call it to be non negative definite this is the no, so at least this is much is true because look here this has we can easily say that this is non negative so this is non negative definite at least so remember this is not for gaussian or anything any autocorrelation function for the wind for the climate everything so long as you have an autocorrelation function it has got this properties free so now i am going to show you so i am going to discuss a few the uh, so if you if a, uh, this is something you should uh, study at home or go and uh, refresh so if a matrix is positive definite or non negative definite then look at uh, it has an eigen structure decomposition i want you to go home and uh, do all this and uh, these eigen values are turn out to be uh, strictly positive if it is positive definite if it is non negative definite these are and this will turn out to be useful so this is uh, this is a good time to study look into matrix properties because all this has to go together and uh, maybe one of the saturdays uh, if you all come i can give you a lecture on the matrix algebra but only if you are interested and i don't want to hear any complaints saying it is a saturday class and so on right if you if you are busy then forget about it so let me do let me start with some uh, simple stochastic processes and some complicated process to some complicated any questions at this point yeah so this is a simple uh, stochastic process with the two realizations so we are tossing a coin if the, if it is head we put the extra face to be zero if it is tail uh, it could be pi so you get two wave forms a more general exam this is one example another example is where the face is let's say a random variable which is uniform in zero to two pi that's a different this is a second example so this is even simpler this is a little more uh, involved 
So what I put in the top is a communication problem, right? You transmit some signal, by the time it comes back, you could get a random face at the receiver. And the face could be uniform from, so let me do the number two. Number one, there is nothing to do. I mean, it's just two waveforms, right? So question is, what is the expected value of X of T? Usually the problem is, let's at least find the mean and autocorrelation function. So expected value of X of T is expected. Where is the randomness here on the right side? Anybody? Where is the randomness? Hmm? In this problem, where is the randomness? On phi, right. That's, so it has a density function, which is uniform. So, but we can expand this as this minus sine omega naught t sine phi. Remember, randomness is only here. So this, of course, you can use, write it as I think this is homework, so I shouldn't do this. But if you expand this, this is going to be expected value of cos phi multiplied by density function d phi. So this will turn out to be zero. This will turn out to be zero. So the mean is zero. I mean, whatever is the rest of it, that's the density function because it's given to be uniform. So let's find out its autocorrelation function. Rxx uh, t1 comma t2 is expected value of xt1, xt2. I don't need to put star here because everything is real. So this is cos omega naught t1 plus phi multiplied by cos omega naught t2 plus phi. We need to find the expected value. Phi is here both the places. So you can see, I can write this as what? Just use the trigonometric expansion. What is it? Cos. So that's uh, cos AB is cos A minus B. Plus or minus. Plus cos A plus B. Divided by two. But look at here, this is a constant because there is no phi. So that goes outside. So you get half cos omega naught tau plus half expected value of cos omega naught t1 plus t2 plus two phi. I'm going to go ask you to go home and expand this and see that this goes to zero, but you have to show that because you can expand this just the way I did it in the previous slide. So the autocorrelation function will turn out to be half cos t1 minus t2. So what kind of process is this? Anybody? What kind of process is this process? What? SSS? I didn't even discuss any of the density function. I just showed the mean is a constant. Autocorrelation depends on t1 minus t2. So what can you conclude? What? Why it's stationary? That's all you can conclude. Why did you say SSS? What? So it's a, this is a white and stationary process, not this one, original one. This one, white and stationary. So if you transmit a, a bunch of sinusoids, so let me ask you to do this uh, at home. Suppose X of T is like this. So I transmit a bunch of sinusoids process. So these random variables are independent. Uh, so my question is, is this white sun stationary or not? So that's the question for you. So you understand the problem. I have a bunch of uh, sinusoids at different frequencies, omega i. 
Each of they are transmitted. By the time they come back, there is a random phase which are uniform, but they are all independent. The random phases are independent. You know, they, of course, there are a bunch of random variables. So you definitely know what I mean by independence. Question is: Is this process wide and stationary? So you need to compute the mean. You need to compute the autocorrelation and see whether the properties are true or false. I did it for one. So you just go through the. Manipulation and see what happens. Let me come to a very important process in uh, queuing theory. So this is the second example. Oh, so look at. Uh, uh, I think the picture explains to you, right? Things are arriving at random, random arrivals. So that's the key. You don't know when the next thing will arrive. So each arrow is indicating an arrival. So what I mark by t tau one tau t one t two are the type of arrival. And what is uh, anybody? What is n zero t? So the way it says is the number of arrivals in the interval zero to t. So that's going to be what number of arrivals will be what you start counting one, two, three, four, etc. So that will be a positive number, not one point five. It will be a positive integer. So if this number of arrivals behave like a Poisson random variable for any interval, we call it a Poisson process. So let me write down. So there are two. Two uh, two conditions. So this is what we call x of t. X of t is the number of arrivals from zero to t. If x of if the number of arrivals equal to k has a Poisson variable with the parameter lambda t. So that's the first condition. So that looks like a Poisson a, 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 a random variable. But with the parameter lambda t, not lambda, so it depends on the duration. K equal to zero, one, two, three, etc. And the second condition is I, I don't have enough space. I'm going to write it on the next page. So this is the first condition. The num uh, probability of x of t equal to k is Poisson with parameter lambda t, not lambda. Lambda t is the duration that you are considering. So this is e raised to minus lambda t, lambda t to the power k over k factor. And the second condition is. So, can you read the second one? Second one says events over non-overlapping intervals are independent. See, I have two intervals: t1, t1 to t2, t3 to t4. They are not overlapping, right? Overlapping intervals will be uh, like this. So you have t1 here, t2 here, t3 here, t4 here. So you have one interval here. And I'm not talking about this. This is not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about here. Those are overlapping intervals. If the intervals are not overlapping, 
then the random variables corresponds to corresponding to these non overlapping intervals are independent in other words so you understand that so right that's the definition of independence the random variables corresponding to these are independent the joint density function is the product of the density function so if the random variables are independent what happens to this anybody this can be written as hello if y and z are independent expected value of yc would be right so this is also true so that's what a uh, poisson process is so what is a poisson process not just the one property you need two conditions arrivals over any interval looks like poisson random variable but arrivals over non overlapping intervals are independent so if i go to a gas station and buy gas at 9 uh, o'clock and and let's say that takes some time 2 minutes or something and if somebody goes at 11 those two events are independent obviously because it's non overlap but if somebody comes during i am there then maybe the, we have some maybe i am going to work that person is going to work so we you can see some dependency that's a sort of a, a loose explanation so what is the problem here let's find the mean and variance of mean and auto correlation function of poisson process that's our your problem my problem so remember x of t is the number of arrivals in 0 to t so expect if you have if you know poisson this is easy expected value of x of t is now n of expected value of n 0 t anybody has the answer you can look at here n 0 t is a poisson random variable with parameter lambda t what is the mean of a random poisson random variable with parameter lambda anybody lambda So what is the, well, <coughs> what is the mean of this process? Anybody? Lambda t because that's the parameter. What is the expected value of x square <coughs> x square t? So for that, let me ask you: What is the variance of x of t? Anybody? X x of t is n of zero comma t. That's Poisson. <coughs> Poisson, you remember what's the variance? What? that's also lambda t so what will be the value of x squared t x squared t is so that's variance plus mean squared right so that's lambda t plus lambda squared see i didn't do anything i just used to probability uh, so remember i need these three relations little later to compute the auto correlations so that's the but that's for poisson we found the mean let's find the auto correlation function or x of t1 and x of t2 independent look at the picture anybody i am not writing star here because this is a real process it's just a counting process auto correlation function is expected value of x t1 x t2 x t1 is the number of arrivals from 0 to t1 x22 is from 0 to t2 are they independent or no they are not independent so you cannot write it as the product <coughs> but so how do you compute that that's the question and but if you look at here x of t2 i can write it as the number of arrivals from 0 to t1 plus the number of arrivals from t1 to t2 and these two are these two are independent so let's try to use that property Uh, so and that's what i'm going to plug it in here so r x x t1 comma t2 is expected value of x of t1 multiplied by x of t1 
plus n of t1 comma t2 so if you if i take this this is expected value of x squared t1 plus expected value of uh, x of t1 multiplied by n of t1 comma t2 anybody these two random variables are what we just wrote it here these two random variables are independent so this expected value will be what so expected value of x squared t is here look at here expected value of x squared t is here so i'm going to copy this lambda t1 plus lambda squared t1 and uh, and what do you get here this is expected value of x t1 multiplied by n of t1 comma t2 right expected value of x t1 is how much this is lambda t1 multiplied by expected value of n t1 comma t2 n t1 comma t2 is a poisson with parameter what look at here n of t1 comma t2 is this is the duration so it's a poisson with t2 t minus t1 what did you say t2 minus t1 t2 minus t1 so expected value of that is this is the expected value of this is the expected value of n of t1 comma t2 so this is lambda multiplied by t2 minus t1 let me write it on the next page so here you get rxx t1 comma t2 if i did everything right you have lambda t1 plus lambda squared t1 uh, plus lambda t1 multiplied by lambda multiplied by t2 minus t1 so if i expand lambda t1 plus lambda squared t1 plus lambda squared t1 t2 minus lambda lambda squared t1 square t1 square yeah so this also is lambda squared t1 squared okay so i do make some small mistakes so this cancels so you get uh, so look at our picture this is with the t1 greater the t2 greater than t1 if we had a t1 greater than t2 all this this will get uh, reversed so this will be t2 t1 which is the same as this this will be lambda t2 so if you want you can write this as so that's the autocorrelation function of a poisson process is it stationary or not is it whitson stationary or any stationary Yes or no? No, right? Because you can see it's not a function of t1 gamma. So Poisson process is not white sensation. If it is not white sensation, we can be strict sensation, right? Hello. Of course not, right? Yeah. So Poisson process is not stationary in any sense. so this is a uh, this is this process is important in queuing theory at least as an ideal approximation to arrivals so let me talk a little bit more five more minutes on poisson processes actually that's the same as next arrival so we want the remember we don't know when the things are you are going to wait for a bus when is the uh, first bus as far as you are concerned that's the next bus when is it going to come so it's going to come at some time we are going to uh, denote that delay this is that delay this is when you arrive that's where the zero so this is the first arrival so this is a random variable question is our question is what is the density function of that random variable 
in other words all the, we are considering poison arrivals so the same process we are considering so then you can ask what about the distribution of the second arrival etc etc remember arrivals are independent so let's look at the first arrival so that's the mean that's the distribution function that means the tau the first arrival is less than or equal to t what what is more convenient is to or physically is to compute this quantity so let's compute this is the same as they are the same right you can write it uh, like this so if you get one you can compute the other right but the, this quantity is more physical so tell me what should i fill up here you have to think physically look at here what i wrote here it says the arrival the first arrival is beyond t so you take some time t saying that the first arrival is beyond t is the same as saying what the number of arrivals in 0 to t is zero so this is the key key uh, argument saying that the first arrival is beyond some small t is the same as saying that the number of arrivals in 0 to t is zero because otherwise uh, the first arrival would have happened but the number of arrivals in 0 to t is a poisson with parameter what anybody this is a poisson random variable with parameter lambda t lambda t so what is the probability of uh, x equal to 0 if x is poisson anybody e raised to e raised to minus lambda but here we put minus lambda t so i got this quantity with using the simple argument so you, let me plug it in here so i have f tau tau is f tau to is 1 minus e raised to minus lambda t you take the density function you get f t t is lambda e raised to minus lambda t for t positive obviously what sort of distributive density function is that anybody what is this density function exponential exponential so we have a theorem in a poisson process the first arrival is exponential i just derived it for you so in fact more generally any inter arrival time is exponential it exactly the same argument because the second arrival you start from here you use exactly the same argument use, using a little randomization so each of these inter arrivals are ex, uh, in, independent they are all independent because uh, the second arrival is independent of the first one once the first one happened everything you see reset the clock so the nth arrival is what so let me call this tau 1 tau 2 tau 3 etc so what i have just shown this is just the inter arrival time this is exponential with the parameter lambda so if i call tn to be tau1 plus tau2 etc tau1 this is the arrival for the nth arrival so each of look at here uh, let me see whether you remember any of this each of this is exp independent exponential anybody remembers if what will happen if you add up independent exponentials what i know but what is the density function if no 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 not uh, not exponential exponential plus exponential is not uh, exponential so this is where you need to go back and refresh uh, anybody is it really what did you say Uh, I said, is it Rayleigh? No, it is not Rayleigh. Rayleigh is x squared plus y squared square root for x and y Gaussian. But you uh, can, uh, you are able to do this actually. You can use characteristic function or simply take two two exponential random variables, find the density function of the sum. That we did, I think, in class or wherever. 
So this will turn out to be gamma, but you, you have to prove it one way or the other way. Uh, so that's all. See, you use probability results. So if probability is weak, you are not going to do anything. All right, so remember what I have done. I find the, we defined the Poisson process. We found the mean and autocorrelation function. And uh, we, I showed you that the first arrival, first random arrival is exponential. The nth random arrival is uh, gamma. Let me do one more property. I hope you can read what I wrote. So you have an original Poisson queue or Poisson arrivals, and I'm going to create two sub arrivals. From X of T, I'm going to create two arrivals, but I'm going to create randomly. So what is the easiest way to create two random queues from the original one without disturbing the original one? How do I create something randomly? That means I each arrival, I either put it here or put it here. What, what could I do, for example, to make it random? Anybody? I have a queue, I can see the arrivals. As each arrival comes, the question is, should I put it here or put it here? How do I decide it randomly? What do I mean? Yeah, you take another coin and you toss it. If I get head, you tell the person to go and stand here. If you get tail, you go and stand here. So you could say that the arrivals go into Y of T with the probability P. So it may look like this. So if I, if I get to P, I put it here. If I get a tail, I put it here. So these are, so the question is, you know, what are the, what can you say? Original one is Poisson. What can you say about these sub cues? So I just wrote here the sub cues are, are generated with the probabilities P and Q by tossing a coin. So let me argue, argue quickly. I take some time instant t, t here, t here. So the number of arrivals in zero to t, obviously on the original queue is Poisson. That's where we start. That is Poisson with parameter lambda t, right? X, which is, so y is, the number of arrivals in zero to T, I'm going to call it NY, zero to T. And Z is the number of arrivals in, uh, in NZ, zero to T. So we look at the whole duration for Y and Z. We want to find out the, right. so if, So look at the picture again, X of T has got all the arrivals from zero to T. I'm going to generate two 
uh, y of t in this fashion. So n is, of course, the random number of arrivals, number of arrivals in zero to t. And xi is a pro xi is such that probability of xi is uh, xi equal to one is p, and the probability of xi equal to zero is q. So if I, if if you when you toss a coin, if you get one, it it counts towards y. You put it. Uh, if it is one or p, you put it here. You put it here. If it is zero, you put it in the other one. And then you add a number. Uh, you you add how many z, uh, ones are here. That will give you y. N minus y will give you z. So what we want is probability of y t equal to m, and z t equal to m. This is very similar to something we have done earlier. So this is what we are interested. Remember, these are the sub queues. So this is the same as probability of y t equal to m. And remember, z is n minus y. So this is uh, so if z is z is n minus y. So if y is m, then this is the same as saying that n is m plus n, right? And this, of course, I can write this as y of t equal to m, given n equal to m plus n, multiplied by probability of n equal to n plus n. Now let me substitute for y here. So y is probability of some sigma xi, i equal to one through n. But n is given to be m plus n. We give one n equal to m plus n. So as before, uh, as we as we argued before, if you look at the left side here, uh, this is there is no capital n here. This is all. So this is independent of this n. So this we can write it as probability of sigma xi i equal to one through m plus n equal to n multiplied by probability of n, which is uh, x of number of arrivals in zero to t equal to n plus n. But this is binomial, and this is a Poisson. With the parameter lambda t, uh, so this is n choose k. N is here uh, the cap m plus n. So m plus n choose k means n factorial m factorial p to the power k. K is here n. Q to the power capital n minus n k, which is m, multiplied by e raised to minus lambda t, lambda t to the power whatever n plus m here. Over n plus m factorial. So this cancels with this, and uh, as before, I'm going to write here p plus q. P plus q is one. So you notice I can, if you want, I can write this as lambda p t. Then I have p here, t here. Then I have lambda q t. So this is also a famous result in queuing theory. From a Poisson queue, if you randomly create it, uh, sub queues, they are they are also Poisson. Look at here, they are also Poisson, and moreover, they are independent. Because the pro the probability turned out to be, remember what we were computing. We were computing the joint density function of y and the z, two random variables, that turned out to be the product. 
so sub q randomly created sub q's of a poisson q or poisson so if you look at the people who go to bank let's say male and female and they go and form a queue then you can say one way you can say is that uh, or the male and female are uh, sub queues or the other way is if you have a big queue in uh, in one bank and if you if the guy is simply you make two queues randomly those two two queue if the original one is poisson the sub queues have the poisson process also poisson no but this is just one stochastic process i am just you can go more and more into it so let me stop at this one here so the theorem is randomly generated sub queues you can create more than two i just showed you two so i just showed you this okay i proved it but showed i meant this so this is a theorem you can try to do it for assume you are um, uh, forming n queues you take a uh, dice with n faces uh, and uh, depending on the outcome you generate n sub queues and then exactly the same thing goes through you can use the same argument so the the arrival times are exponential if you start adding the exponential you get the gamma random variable and i'll come back to this a little later in a coupon collecting problem if you mix up uh, the two types of poisson processes and uh, or maybe three types of poisson processes so i have three colors here right uh, green blue and red so this is the first arrival of the first process this is the first uh, second arrival of the first process this is the uh, first arrival of the second process right so tij means what did i say first uh, i ith arrival of j to process in a coupon collecting you have different serial boxes right so each serial box may have a coupon so when you open a box you get the first arrival of some process when you open the second box you may get the same coupon or you may get a different coupon then it will be the first arrival of a, a second process etc and what is that you are looking for you want to collect each coupon of all the processes so tij is the ith arrival of the jth process so what we are what we want is t so first we may say some something t11 t so we want these things are going to these are the first arrivals of the first process second process etc they are not going to come in order they are going to come in some fashion so here for example you can see the blue is only coming here this is the first arrival of the third process so to get if there are three coupons you have to wait this long this is the waiting time involved to get uh, for coupon collecting you understand the coupon collecting problem right so if you are having it if you is uh, if a couple are having children you may say i'm going to wait till i get a, a boy and girl so the first arrival is the first arrival of one type of thing then you can first you may get a boy then you may get a boy then you then so ultimately when you girl you stop it that's the stopping time right for example question is how long does it take so an interesting problem in coupon collecting is this is a random variable you don't know when this is going to happen so what are we looking for how do we connect t to this anybody what will be the relation of t t will be what 
these times are going to come whenever they are going to come so t is the coupon collecting time where i have one coupon of each process so what are we looking for anybody the relation look at this picture how how do i relate it t1 t2 t1 uh, t to this t11 t12 t13 etc maximum or what is it again anybody exactly right maximum right so you can see this is an application of max now right and you know all these are exponentials so you can see where but exponentials with different lambdas so you are all i'll come right back to this later or i want you to think about this let me go to something else uh, we have a little bit time as uh, an example so you can see where this evolves right this is the coupon collecting problem stopping time this is called the stopping time so stopping time is a general concept it's a random variable obviously so uh, you are waiting for something and the something is that's a complex process all this all this has to happen and the first instant the last one comes uh, I'm done. Right. So the question is uh, this one. This is your job. You can see whether you can do it. Otherwise, you. so you can see each uh, each of this so i am uh, each time instant i take a step forward or backward step size is this is the step size i take a step forward with probability p let's say equal to half backward with also probability q so the question is i keep doing this and i add up all my step sizes and let's say the each step takes some duration delta small delta so that i add up uh, t over small delta gives you gives me the number of steps so i create a process like this so what i am asking is after t time where am i going to be so this is like a random walk right 1d random walk so now uh, why why do we call it wiener process i'm going to make the step i'm going to study the limiting behavior as the step size becomes smaller and step time becomes smaller but uh, let's uh, let's uh, so what is the expected value of xi xi is you can see it takes two values delta multiplied by p minus delta multiplied by q if p and q are equal then that is zero so what's the value of uh, uh, so x of t is limit or delta tends to zero delta is the duration and delta tends to zero such that summation of x i i equal to so let's see what is r x x uh, t1 comma t2 so this is expected value of xt1 multiplied by xt2 let's do it for t1 is here t2 is here so x of t1 look at here x of t1 is the number of events here 
x of t2 is the number of events from here to here and here. So x of t2, I can write this as x of t1 multiplied by x of t1 multiplied by whatever is going on between x of t2 and x of t1. So I'm going to call this by some other random variable y. Y is the number of events, uh, the process from uh, uh, t1 to t2. So when I take the product, this is expected value of x squared t1 plus expected value of x t1 multiplied by y t1 comma t2. Remember, these are independent Bernoulli, each of them. So the independent Bernoulli happening here has nothing to do with this. They're all independent. So the expected value of the, the product of the expected value is, they are independent. So the product of the expected values, but expected value of X of T1 is zero and Y of T1 is zero also. So this is zero. Let's do this. This is what? Uh, the step size uh, delta multiplied by delta squared multiplied by half plus minus delta squared multiplied by half. So that's going to be simply delta squared, right? Rxx uh, t1, t2. No, no, I'm sorry. This is, uh, so x squared t1 is, let me call this n. I guess I'm doing it too fast. Let me do it in the next page. So expected value of x squared t1 is expected value of sigma xi n squared. But this is summation xi squared plus double summation xi xj, right? Expected value. i equal to j, i is no, i not equal to j when you expand this. So this is expected value of xi squared. Again, the same argument, when i is not equal to j, this is expected value of xi multiplied by expected value of xj. So this is zero. And this is going to be, there are n such them, and each of them we just found out here, delta squared. And n is what? n is t over small delta. So I can, this is in a T1, not T, T1, right? From zero to T1, zero is here. So del remember delta is the step size. This is the step duration. I'm going to assume that these, these are constants. I'm going to assume that uh, delta squared over delta is some constant alpha, so that this is alpha t1. This is for t2 greater than t1. So the, remember what we just found out was expected value of rxx t1 t2. I went through all this stuff, right? So this is the rxx t1 comma t2. So it is uh, alpha t2 if uh, t1 if t1 is greater than t2 or together i can write it as alpha multiplied by minimum of t1 comma t2 so just follow through the argument that i did so what we have is a wiener pro or a white no a random walk 1d random walk in limiting case Its autocorrelation function is uh, minimum of t1 gamma t2. So, if that's an autocorrelation function, what must be true? If I create an autocorrelation matrix, this must be. We just prove the property. This must be what? Non-negative definite. So, I am going to ask you. There is proof in my videos, you just have to look at it. Uh, just using matrix manipulation, show that this a matrix is actually this, uh, has this property. Please look at the proof, this, because this doesn't prove anything. This is, of course, you can put two, two together, but take minimum of T1 comma T2 as a matrix A. So AIJ is minimum of, this is AIJ. 
show that if you create a matrix that's going to be non negative definite so a random walk 1d random walk has this autocorrelation function so that's a uh, that's a stationary or non stationary process anybody stationary or not station not so it's not white sin stationary of course it's not strict sin stationary now this takes a little bit doing you need to do the previous exercises i am going i think one of the homework problems ask you to do this as a <coughs> x of t is random walk i forgot to tell you that you can easily argue that random walk is also gaussian why is that look at here maybe we'll do it next week uh, if the random walk is a sum of a large number of uh, random variables and uh, i didn't uh, we didn't go over it but if you add a large number of random variables that's uh, asymptotically that will look gaussian so because we have a large number of gauss random variables this process is a gaussian process so a random walk is a gaussian process with this autocorrelation function so your problem is find r y y t1 comma t2 so remember r y one t1 to you have to use this expression so let me give you some hints this is completely defined uh, i mean this problem is solved some in the way. so don't look at it first this is the definition because you have j j is square root of minus 1 so you can see what is going on is i am frequency modulating a remember you came to electrical engineering i am frequency modulating a random walk a random walk is a gaussian process with autocorrelation function which is uh, minimum of t1 gamma t2 what i am going to ask you is find the autocorrelation function of this it looks complicated but you have to do use make use of the gaussian properties all this stuff and uh, interesting thing is this one you can show that when you do this process remember gaussian walk, gaussian walk, i mean random walk was not gaussian so rxx t1 comma t2 is uh, alpha minimum of t1 comma t2 this is not uh, stationary but r y y if you do it properly you will see some stage some kind of stationarity so we can create so the moral of the story is you may start with sometimes through a non linear process like frequency modulation you may be able to create uh, to convert a non stationary process into what well, i please to white some stationary etc any questions yeah